Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. So I need the paper so I don't digress too much. So, um, and also I've heard I have to talk to this. So I just oh, good, good, good. Even more. Speak into it. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So um, let me start. I'm, I am indescribably lucky to have grown up in a family consisting of my sister Dorsey, my two brothers Bill and Jack. Of course, me, the baby of the family, and then my parents, um, Billy and Bo, about whom you'll hear a little bit more, who it's, we, everybody loved to read, and we apparently had to do this books. There were many, many books, and of course, most of them came from the Stone and Free Library. And um, we uh, were read to every single night, and um, we were read to repeatedly. I remember the Narnia books we were read to. It's only when I was maybe 15 years later that I realized I had a little more of a message than I had originally thought, which made me appreciate all the more being read to repeatedly, which is something that can happen when you have a wonderful library like the Stone and Free Library. Um, and we also learned that reading is not a passive endeavor, that reading is something that should engage you and 
exercise you and something that would make you think and, and talk. And in part, this was because of my father, Bill Boat, a.k.a. Vic, a.k.a. with a lot of different names everybody had, um, that among his many uh, endeavors, one of them was that he used to review books, including books, children books. So he would have us um, read the books. It wasn't any inquisition, but he would have us read the books, and then we'd talk about them. So this was something that was a really a wonderful opportunity, and it kind of, in, in, I think it helped us to, to develop what is called in academia, critical thinking. <laughs> but I think also that this kind of critical thinking may have been innate. My father was an engineer and a scientist, and he has a book published in 1970 in hydronautics with um, Herbert she Herman Sheets, and Duke has it, I'm happy to say. Um, and uh, my mother, Billy, also Mary, another Mary, um, was among many other of her very, very wide commitments. She was a thinking politician, which now I sometimes think of as kind of a social scientist. And these kind of day jobs were, were supplemented and enhanced by their very, very deep commitment to uh, reading novels and poetry and history, that is, the life of the mind and humanities. And they, when they first were married, they lived in Virginia, North Virginia, and of course, in Virginia, and ran a bookstore. Then when the children arrived, I think they felt they needed a little bit more of a steady income. And so they ended up uh, coming up here. But one demonstration of kind of their commitment to um, to the word and to communications and to making things clear is this photograph which I have with kindness of Steve Slosberg who wrote a fantastic article a couple of years ago about this very thing. And this is going to us only some of the many postcards, I should say, that my parents sent to Steve over the years. And the postcards also make me think that one time a few years ago, the first time I went to Washington University in St. Louis, I wandered into the library, because I like libraries, and I, I think somebody had said, well, there's a Jimmy Merrill archive there. And I thought, okay, I'll go and see that. And there were three full boxes of letters from my parents. My mother very breezy, and most of them were postcards from my mother. And uh, most of them kind of breezy from my mother thanking him for champers, and my father's would be a little bit more, not profound, but champers are pretty profound, but would be about some topic of conversation that had come up, and he just wanted to continue. So this was a, a really nice thing. It was a little bizarre because I had only the, the, the notes and stuff from my parents to Jimmy and not the other way around. And it felt a little bit like I was in the kitchen at 16 Denison and overhearing them on the phone because I didn't know what Jimmy would have said. Um, and, uh, and so, I would also want to, oh, I've done that already, good. It's hard not with my glasses, sorry. <laughs> um, I would say that I've always felt very much at home and welcome in libraries, thanks to the Stonington Free Library. Um, the walk to the library, which to me always seemed like a jewel, a prize, set off in the middle of Guadalajara Square with those beautiful, very unusual diagonal walkways into it, always was a wonderful place to go to. And we were always welcomed, and in particular, I remember by the librarians, particularly I remember Rose York, who was librarian there in the 60s, and how welcoming she was. Perhaps I remember her more than others, but she was also our neighbor. And so it was a place to go and to read, and. And in fact, one day, I guess I had graduated to the young adult books, as they call them now. I thought of them as chapter books. And I just thought, I don't know, hubristically, I'll just read all of them, just one after another. <laughs> and it was a beautiful autumn day. The sun was coming, and it's quiet in the library. And 
I finished my book and I closed it and I looked around and I was the only one left. And uh, I thought, hmm, but of course I had known um, Rose York well enough that she knew where the phone was, I called my mother, my mother came and got me, but by that time I had started the next book, which I was sad I couldn't take out and take home. But, so it's always been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. So um, mention of my mother brings us to the second part of my talk, <laughs> Imperial <laughs> Women of Rome. Unfortunately, I could not find a picture of my mother at the book fair. So if any of you have that, I would love that. And instead, I thought I would put up um, the Imperial Woman I am absolutely obsessed with now, Agrippina the Younger. You won't see much of her. But again, just these two images of her are indicative of something I hope that I'll bring out, kind of the elusiveness of this subject, because we know about imperial women as we know about most women of the ancient world, only through the words of men, only through how others, I guess now they would say, curated their image. So we have these two images. The one on the left is from the New Lithotech in, in Copenhagen, and the one on the right is a beautiful piece, as you can well imagine, from the, uh, from the Getty Villa. Um, and, uh, and if you look at them closely, they don't actually look completely alike. I think the one on the left is a little bit more true to life, if we can even say that, because one of the things we hear about Aquapina is that she had the lucky double canine. She had two, she had a double canine tooth on her right side. And you can kind of see it with the overlight in the left hand hair drop. So my mother, of course, I, I don't think I understood as a, as a child how unusual it was for a woman to go into politics in the 1960s. You know, she served as, as Stonington's tree warden. She became Stonington's representative to Connecticut's General Assembly, served on the Republican National Committee from 1974 to 91. And so it was kind of, I guess, natural for me to be attracted to women in politics, women in power. But I think more impressive to me in the long run was to be living with her and to see what that actually meant, kind of women in politics, women in power. I saw firsthand my mother's unceasing work for numerous causes, numerous communities. She campaigned every year, sometimes successfully, other times not. She served on the Connecticut Commission of Aging and then on the White House Commission on Aging. And this was back in the day where we all thought we would never get old. And, uh, and, and she did it uncomplainingly. She thought it was very fascinating and a real challenge, and she did a wonderful job. And so even when, and I would say that even when I was a child and my mother started out, it was clear that power meant responsibility, power meant obligation. And it's things that sometimes draw one away from fun, sometimes even family. Um, and, uh, and even my mother's reign, her annual reign as the queen of the book fair, which she uh, did from 1975 to 2000, she would spend six months at least in a cavernous, dusty place, sneezing incessantly. It was either too cold or too hot, but the books must go on. And it was a wonderful contribution to the society. So surely, I guess I would say, that the experiences of my mother have pushed me to realize that people in power, and especially women in powerful places, are human beings who are under constraints of many kinds. No matter how powerful an individual may seem now, no matter how extraordinary he or she may seem to act, seem to look, that person's choices and possibilities are shaped by the past and also by present forces. And that kind of recognition is behind my own historical research, including on uh, Roman imperial women. And um, as with the, it had a very nice introduction, it's Rome, the imperial women of Rome, power, gender, context. So 
So one of the things I've tried throughout this work, five years or more, or more is to think about these competing forces of historical contingency and human agency. And, um, and it's super fun. It's been fantastic. So I know I'm coming on, and my students always think I have too big of a preamble. But um, let me just say by, uh, one definition before I go into it. By imperial women, just I want to define that, I mean women related by blood or marriage to an emperor. And I've done a couple of different pieces, uh, um, various individual. And I knew that I would not find a lot of information out there. And one of the reasons is what is indicated in this slide. This is one of my favorite images of a woman from the ancient world. Favorite, not favorite, I don't know. Um, she just seems to me to epitomize the status of many women in the ancient world. Completely swayed up. We don't see her. She's bending over. She's She's attractive, elusive, we have no idea what she is thinking. And part of this is that, it, part of the reason for that is that women were excluded by law and by custom from politics and militaries. And this was because they were deemed to have weak minds and judgment. They were deemed to be fickle and not to be, not to be able to stick with it. We even have it enshrined in the digest, which is the Roman legal code. And so that meant that they were not part women because they could not be in these arenas. Women were not part of most of the noteworthy events or the events that Roman historians figured were noteworthy. Because what they liked to talk about was men electing, going into battle, sacking cities, founding cities, oratory, Cicero, you think of all these things, and women are not part of them. They're, they can't even compete. Um, so we don't hear very much about women um, when we are looking at the, document, at the literary sources. And then there's another little aspect of it, which is that when we do hear about women, particularly in the early period of so-called monarchy in the Republic until about the turn into the Common Era, when we do hear about women in these early periods, even later, what they do reflects upon their menfolk. So, uh, you know, for instance, poor Claudius, the Emperor Claudius, is so disparaged because he was under the thumb of his wives. Well, it's not so much his wives, of course, nobody like them either, but it's mostly because he was not a leader. He should be the important one. He should be the man who's telling other people to do. So a lot of what we hear about women is filtered in very different ways. And two of the kind of tropes that one sees when you're thinking about women in the ancient world and the Roman world can be epitomized by these two um, images. And on the left, we see a beautiful painting by Titian of a horrible, horrible aspect of Roman history, the rape of Lucretia, who was the dutiful, pious, lovely, submissive wife of Brutus, and when, um, and, and in 510 BC, of course we know the date for sure, right? But in 510, <laughs> under the end of the monarchy, the king's son saw her and thought, whoo, she is something. She's so beautiful and nice, let me defile her. So he came back the next day and had dinner, and then she was saying, OK, it's time to go. And he said, I want you. And she said, no. She said, you can kill me. He said, well, what I'm going to do is kill you and kill the slave and say that I found you in a flagrante delicto. So anyhow, this we see of the two of them. And these kinds of stories are very common in the early Roman history because the violation of a woman is a violation of the Roman state. And it precipitates a revolution. And in this case, it precipitated the overthrow of the, of the monarchy and the establishment of the republic. 
And on the right, we see another image, which is Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi. And this is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful sculpture that is in the Dorsey in the central part when you go in. And uh, from the middle of the, uh, 19, of the 19th century. And Cornelia was the daughter of the conqueror of, um, of Carthage in the Second Punic War. She was really very high placed. She married another very high, highly placed man. She bore him 12 children. They had 12 children, of whom only three survived, in, uh, survived childhood and infancy, and that's a whole other talk. And, um, and there was two boys, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, who were important in kind of the end of the Republic, and also a daughter. I think it's pretty telling that we see her with just the two boys. And she's known for, again, kind of the ideal is to be submissive, not to make waves. And she had a dinner party one day, and all the other women came in and the Republic, and they're wearing all their jewels. And they said, Cornelia, why are you so drab? What's the matter? And she called her children to her, and she said, these are my jewels. So this is kind of, so, so you have, you know, it's the violation of a woman is one thing. And you have the, the wonderful woman who is the mother, the best mother. And then there is another kind of trope that we see in one of my favorite pictures. And this is of the woman who is a little too powerful. And we see it often connected with a woman who is a foreigner. And in this case, it's Cleopatra. So a woman who exerts power, who wants to do something, who wants to have, she, she was the queen of Egypt, and she wanted to take advantage of the, the squabbling all the Romans did to get, make her own kingdom better. Didn't happen, didn't work out that way. But here we see this painting which, of course, again, is from the end of the 19th century. But it shows us this trope of the seductress, powerful woman who is a manning man. People like Mark Antony, you see him coming and tiptoeing in with his toga on him with a sheepish look as he's tiptoeing in. It didn't work out for him very well. <laughs> So there were some women who were, there were some public roles for women, not that many, but religion was the most important, probably. And so women were um, involved in religion for their community and also for home. And so we see on the bottom left a wonderful Italian grave relief from first century, we're not quite sure exactly, but first century BC. And it's, we can see, try my laser pointer, um, we can see women mourning the deceased. Here's the deceased, and here's the woman mourning. And so this is appropriate. You, this is what the, the family uh, gathers around, the women mourn. And then in the upper right, what we see are the vessel virgins of Rome. Of course, in this wonderful uh, piece, which is the Arapacus, or the altar of peace, built 13 to 9 BC. And um, these are portrayed on the innermost part of the altar. No one would have seen them except for the officiating priests. They're about this tall. But it just reminds us that there were actually roles for women who were um, in religion in the ancient world. But overall, I think in the ancient world, particularly in the Republic, and in the monarchy, when women are in public, it's crisis time. And here we see another fantastic painting. This isn't the rape of the Sabine women. It's the aftermath of the rape of the Sabine women. A couple of years later, when the um, Sabines, who had lost all their women, the, the Romans had settled Rome, but only bad boys came. There weren't any women around. They said, oh, yeah, we need some women. So they said, let's have a party. We're going to have a big circus. And the women are going to ask the state lines, our neighbor. And then in the middle of the circus races, the Romans 
men went down and seized the women and took them home. And so the Sabons waited for a couple of years, and then they came back when they recouped strength to fight and get their women back. And of course, the story is that the, and we see Ursilia in the center here, who was the wife of Romulus, first king of Rome, and she said, we all love one another. You're my father. You're my husband. The babies are there. And it's women as mediators. So, but it's crisis time. This is when women are in public and have a role. It's crisis time. My students usually say, how did they fight when they're naked? But that's not <laughs> fair. So, I was interested in thinking about once we get to the empire, once we get to the print of it, which I'll explain in a second, things have to change. And one thing that's different is we just simply have a lot more evidence. So we have, as we see on the left here, we have more sculptures. We have more um, freestanding or relief sculptures like this. This is from Aphrodisias, which is inland a couple of hours from Ephesus in Tur modern Turkey. And then we have, on the lower right, we have coins. There are more coins that show women. And I'll talk about in a moment about how the first living woman depicted on a coin from Rome is from Caligula's reign. So it's late. It's late. Romans have been coining, coining silver and brass and everything for centuries. But women appear late. But they do appear. And then on the upper right, one of the things I like to have my students work with. This is an inscription which has, I mean, the women aren't really there, although some of their names are. This is a, an inscription that shows us a Damnachio Moria after Elagabalus, one of the most bizarre of the Roman emperors in the early third century, but completely out of his mind. After he was assassinated, then his name was chiseled out, also the name of his mother and his grandmother. And um, so we see kind of, but they were there at one time. So, so we have inscriptions, we have papyri, we have legal documents, coins, and, and so there is more evidence from the empire. But the thing that was my kind of hook for it was that the empire is something different. It wasn't the republic when men were ruthlessly fighting with one another for dominance, to be consul, to have triumph, to all these things. It's different because there was a new regime. And it's often called the Principate, as I have it bolded there. And the Principate is, um, is when Rome was supposed to be under the aegis, shall I say, under the kind of guidance and authority of the princeps, the first among equals, what well, we know about first among equals. And Augustus is the first one. And, um, and we see him here from the uh, Augustus Prima Porta, which actually is from a villa that his wife Livia had and, uh, and comes afterwards. And it is, the point of it is an amazing, amazing challenge. It was one emperor with his family and his court, and maybe it's been counted that maybe about a thousand people of the very highest administrators controlled all the area that you see in pink. And so how did that happen? But we're not going to go into that. Part of what I say is it happened precisely because of the imperial women of Rome, because of the family. And we hear about this a little bit. Here is an image of the outside of the Arapacus, the building I showed you the vessel virgins from. And um, we hear about this through the words of Appian, who was a historian of the second century AD. And he's looking back with hindsight, 150 years, 140 years, and writing about Augustus, and he says, Augustus's rule was strong and lasted a long time. And it's true, Augustus fought the power in the 30s. He didn't die until 40, 30s BC, died in 14 AD. That's a long time. People get used to things when it's that long. And, and uh, Appian goes on and says, well, since he was fortunate in everything he did, and was regarded with fear, I love 
of that statement. He left the family dynasty to succeed him and to enjoy a power similar to his own. And you cannot have a family dynasty or even a strong family without women. And this um, image is of the, um, it's called the Grand Cameo of France. And it is a cameo that is 12 inches high. 10 inches wide. It's, it is an amazing piece. And of course, scholars have no idea who exactly is on it. I mean, we don't know which are the women who are on it. You can see some of them uh, here and here, and then there's another one over here. We don't know exactly who is on it, but I don't think that matters. More important is that women are part of this celebration of triumph over the barbarian, this imperial celebration of triumph over the barbarian. And then the other thing that was kind of calling me to think about this was I thought, well, before I retire, I really want to learn about things I don't really know that much about, even though I've been in the biz for 40 years. And one of them was coins. I just never had dived into coins. And this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to know more. So here we see two different coins that were struck and have a portrait of Domitia Mongana, who's the uh, wife of Domitian. Very confusing. Get a different name already. But uh, it ruled at the end of the first century. And so we see her up at the top in something that's pretty conventional when women start appearing on coins. They are to epitomize familial piety, being a good mom and all of that. And then on the bottom, there she is again with her honker over the nose, and um, she looks, she's not, um, I don't think she would win a beauty contest. And on the right, the back of that coin is Venus, or Augustine Venus, that shows Venus with her arm on a little pedestal, and neck it down below her bo booty. I mean, can you imagine having one of our first ladies and <laughs> our It's just, I, I thought I'd find out more. But I knew that it would be a little bit of a hard slog because we don't have any personal voices of these women. There were, we know that Agrippina the Younger, the one I showed you with the two images, she wrote memoirs nothing remains. And I show you that, yes, there were educated women. This is a very famous fresco from uh, Pompeii on the left, showing us a young woman with a gorgeous piece. It's about to write in a, um, it's actually a wooden leaf. And we do know that the imperial women were witty, educated, but we don't have any of their voices. Finally, we're going to the women themselves, a little bit at least. So my simple question was kind of, the what is the role? What are the roles of the imperial women of Rome? The princeps, first among equals. So who, what, what roles did his wife play, or his daughter, or his mother? And here we see, I love these, uh, these pieces. They're from Pestum um, on the western coast of Sicily below the Bay of Naples. And they're just about this high, each of them. And they were done probably in the 20s AD. I will say that, August, uh, that Livia, also called Julia Augusta at this time, was 70. I'd like to go to her. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There. And in fact, uh, people who really work on um, iconography will say that she, you see how her chin papers down like his, their, their cheeks are very similar, so mother and son look very harmonious. It was not the case. Uh, Tiberius, did, he resented his mother. He really, he, he would tell her, we hear from Suetonius, stop meddling in things that do not belong to women. And she, on the other hand, I always have a soft spot for mothers, but to boys of my own, she said, I'm the one who made you emperor. So, <laughs> so yeah, you know, they weren't really, and so what roles did they play? And finally, I'm still in preamble, it seems like. Um, finally, I also have, have had to think about 
not getting bedazzled by these stories. Things like, like, like Julia Russo, Olivia, telling her son, you know, I'm the one in charge, I did it. And here it makes me think about um, a lovely story about the third wife of Caligula, um, a woman by the name of Lolia Polina, supposed to be very, very pretty. And um, she met up with uh, Pliny the Elder, who was an encyclopedist, at a dinner party. I think she cut him dead. She probably refused to talk to him. He's an equestrian, kind of a funny duddy. So he writes later about her as the mulierkula, like the little hussy, and how she was wearing in her hair, on her hair, wreaths on her hair, in her earrings, a wreath on top of her hair, and pectoral uh, jewelry, and rings, and bracelets, all in gold and, and um, pearls and emeralds. And he gives us how much it cost, which was 10 million times the daily wage of a laborer. And, and then he, he showed her what her, her um, where she should be. And here, although we don't really see, we have no idea what she looked like, but just to give some idea of kind of the wealth and how things could be bedazzled, I show on the left and on the right two beautiful young women. These are called fine moon portraits or mummy portraits, and they're from the Roman period in Egypt. The Louvre has a ton of these if you can struggle out of the crowd. And, um, and you see these young women with their emeralds and their pearls. And in the lower right, there is a pair of earrings that who knows how much they cost in the ancient world, but they have emeralds and pearls and gold. So when I say uh, I had to watch out for being bedazzled by my women, one of the things I'm a social historian, so I also want to remember about the workmen who are putting these things together, absolutely toxic fumes. And the people who are diving for the pearls and the people who are the miners, it's a terrible, terrible life that they had. So I always started weighing all these things together. So, um, a couple of stories I'll start with. And what I did with my book was how I divided it into different chapters, each of which addresses like a big theme, law, religion, power, and the like. And, but I wanted to ensure that my women had a voice. I mean, people haven't, I mean, they need a voice. And so I opened every one of my chapters with what I call a vignette. And the one for religion, I opened with this. And this is it's a very, very handsome coin. It's a Cistercius, which doesn't, it's not that valuable. It's a brass coin, but it's big. It's about, it's bigger than, you know, it's this big. And, um, and we see on it Caligula looking very handsome. He's about 25 years old here. And then on the right-hand side, we see his three sisters, and they are identified by name. So we see Agrippina, that's Agrippina the Younger, Drusilla in the middle, and then Julia, who's Julia LaVilla, and everybody has the same gang names, it drives you crazy, um, and she is on the right. And so this is the first time that living women are identified on a coin, struck and wrong. Of course, one of the reasons that Caligula was doing it was he wanted to say, this is a new start. I am the new emperor. Everything's going to be all aboard and very good. That didn't last very long. And, um, but the three women are not depicted as you or I might be depicted, but they are depicted as abstractions. So on the left, Agrippina is securitas, or security. And then Drusilla is Concordia, who's harmony. And then on the right is Fortuna, which is good fortune. And so starting with these vignettes was so much fun because it allowed me to think about, well, coins as evidence. And, and it also allowed me to say something about Caligula and his sisters. Everybody likes to hear about Caligula. You know, Caligula was a nut. And um, so when he was very close with his sisters, um, at the beginning of his reign, so close in fact that he is rumored to have had incestuous relations with Drusilla, 
the one in the middle. All three sisters were married, but that doesn't matter. Um, and when she died in 39, um, he had her deified. And, uh, and the problem was that it wasn't such a happy relationship. It wasn't any security for Agrippina. It wasn't any blessed good fortune for La Villa. He had them exiled. So, uh, you know, it gets, let you see how powerless some of these women are. And another kind of sad story that's associated with Caligula, and it's not just him, but it has to do with his mother, Agrippina the Elder. And you can see her in, a, there's a bust of her on, on the right that's in Papaline Museums in Rome. And then we see a coin of her in one of these cisterci. So these are big, they don't, they're not that, um, they're not precious metal. So it means that they probably circulated more, so the people saw them more. So we see her on the right, and, um, and it extols her. Well, she had an extremely uh, hard life. She uh, was married to Germanicus, who was the, he was kind of the designate emperor after Tiberius. And she went with him to travel through the Roman world, much more so than other people. She was up in Germany, she went to the Aegean, she went to Syria, she went to Egypt, she actually had children in Cologne, in modern day Cologne, and also on the island of Lesbos. But while she was traveling with her husband, he died. Germanicus died, and there was a lot of rumors that Tiberius, her Germanicus, her, her, her relation, shall we say, had been the one to do it. And we see a wonderful image that you all can see at the Yale Art Museum of um, Agrippina the Elder bringing the ashes of Germanicus back to Italy. And she is in the front and she's carrying the jar with the ashes and she has her children with her. She had to come back and just soldier on. And she had to live in the palace with Tiberius, who she felt had orchestrated her husband's death. He wouldn't let her marry again. And one night they were having dinner together. I can't imagine how terrible that would be. It's in the late 20s. And he offered her an apple, and she refused it. And he got very upset, because it meant that she was saying, you probably poisoned that apple. And she was denounced a couple of months later, and she ended her life on a tiny speck of an island in 33, um, starved to death. So these stories can be very, very upsetting. Here's another one that I wanted to show, um, because it was our um, public, uh, it was for, used for the public publicizing this. And we see on the left, um, Julia Domna, she's got some nice earrings on, and Septimius Severus, who was the emperor from 193 to 211, and then there's a boy in front, and then a blob. And the reason for the, this is probably from the 190s, and it is a um, painted with tempera, and again, it's pretty big, it's about 12 inches diameter. So what is happening with that other little boy? Well, these two boys who were Gaeta and Caracalla, the two boys were the darlings of their parents' eyes, maybe, and they fought incessantly. And even before Septimius Severus died in 211, they were still fighting. And afterwards, it got worse. Who was going to be the emperor? Septimius Severus had said on his deathbed, love one another, the hell with everybody else, and love the army. Well, they did not love one another. And the story is that Julia Domna was in the palace, and Gaeta was talking to her, and Caligula sent his men in, and the men killed Gaeta in Domna's lap. And she had a soldier on as the imperial dowager until, until Caracalla got his in 217 when he was assassinated. So what we see here is another Domnatio Memoria. The face of one of the children has been scratched out. And I think they've even found that it's excrement that's on it. So Caracalla is like, I am the world, and I'll leave that. 
Now, I'm going to start kind of doing the takeaways here. There were some special perks for, uh, for the imperial women. Most of them come in the early period. They come under Augustus. So that we hear in 35 BC, 35 BCE, 9 BC, that they get some perks that they have tribunition protection. Nobody can talk badly about them. They disappear. They did get the right of statuary. And you can imagine that we've seen all these statues. Here we're looking at an image on the left of Octavia, who was Augustus's sister, and on the right we're looking at Livia, Augustus's wife. They look very similar, right? But the, uh, the uh, statuary, as we've seen, the images that are seen of these women, they're almost all in the family. So we show that our pockets above these are all ones that we've seen, that it's the celebration of women as in the family, as the ones who legitimate the transmission of power. And even with wealth, I think about, so we have those same earrings from the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And then, um, so in the early period, yes, women were swanning around, like as did Lolia Polina. By the middle of the second century, the evidence we have for women trolling wealth is brick stamps, as we see on the bottom. So you have a brick factory, stamp it. This one, uh, this one demonstrates that Domitian, the wife of Domitian, was the owner of this. And then guess what? You put it in a wall, and it's only the archaeologists 20, uh, 2,000 years later who know what's going on. But there are a couple of takeaways that I would point to. One is in the realm of religion. And this is something that I guess I should have expected, because religion was the one place where women could have public presence. And so after Augustus dies in, in uh, AD 14, his wife, Livia, gets her name changed to Julia Augusta, and she is appointed to be the priestess of the cult of Augustus. He becomes a deus, or he's consecrated. And she is his um, priestess. So here we see her praying. And then by the time you heard about Drusilla, Caligula's, his wife, his sister, Caligula's um, sister, who he had deified in 38, but much more lastingly was um, the deification of Livia in 42. And, um, and by the end, there were 14 different imperial women in my period, up to 235 AD, who were deified, which compares to 19 imperial men. That's not such a big statistical difference. And here we see at the top a very I, don't, I never understood. The guy on the bottom left of that, he's holding the, the, uh, the sundial, and, and it's a little odd. But, um, so there's the, uh, the consecration of Antoninus Pius and his wife, Faustina the Younger. And then we see uh, one at the bottom right of Sabina, who is the wife of Hadrian, and she's getting carried up to the heavens. And what was important was that women in the provinces were in charge of these, of the cult for these imperial women. So there is a kind of trickle down giving more roles to people in the municipalities, people in the provinces. This woman comes from, um, from uh, where is she from? She's from Tunisia, she's now in Tunisia. It's a huge statue, six feet, four inches, obviously dominated. And she's identified as a priestess of the imperial cult. So there is a little bit of a, um, a, a widening of the restricted uh, group of people who can get public accolades. And then there is, and I have only two, three more slides, then there is another thing which I'll rush over. The women of the, the imperial women were also intermediaries. They had a liminal position. They, because of their proximity to the emperor, they're right there. They're 
listening to what's going on, that may be putting in a word or two, but because of their gender, they can ne never make a decision themselves. So we hear about a couple of these women who are intermediaries for groups who normally are not talked about in the Roman world except with disgust, Jews and Christians. And uh, so we hear on, on the right, we see an image of Papea, who was Nero's second wife. He loved her, loved her. And she intervened with Josephus, the great historian who uh, fought in the first uh, Jewish revolt against Rome, 66 to 73. But he turned and joined the Roman side. That's a different story. And she intervened with him to smooth some transactions he was having with the Roman state. He calls her God-fearing and pious. We hear from other, the more mainstream stories, she liked to bathe herself in ass's milk to keep her, her skin nice and dewy. She was a libertine. She screamed at everybody, including Nero. And on the right, we see Julia Mamea, who was the mother of Alexander Severus. She was killed with Alexander Severus in 235. And um, she is said to have met with one of the patristic fathers with Oregon to debate the pros and cons of Christianity. So we see them in different ways. So where are we? We're right near the end. So I would say after all this time working, I, I know I hope to find a little more of what I would think was liberated women. And I think that overall, the women, the imperial women of Rome, were much more Melania Trumps than they were Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama. <laughs> and, and, and they were, not to mention Angela Merkel. God. <laughs> so they were not equal. And they were, they were separate, but they were always there. And yet, even though they could not make decisions that bound other people, their stories still deserve to be told. And it is a challenge and a pleasurable one to make a compelling narrative about these people that can bring in other aspects of the Roman world. So thank you very much. Do you have 
go to Ovid maybe to find. Yeah. Ob Ob Ovid is so, a, so the, the, the point two point. So the first was thinking about prototypes for both Greek women. Yeah, I mean, to, to what degree did the Romans draw upon the roles of women in Greek society and they were forming their own society? Yeah, this is a great question because part of it is that we think about the Greek society and what we're really thinking about is Athenian society in the 5th century BC. And by the time the Romans are involved, we've got Alexander the Great and all of the, you know, the epitome, so called, all the ones who followed him, which are dynasties. These are Hellenistic kings and queens. And so that we do have over in the east. We have Arsinoe, who's with Ptolemy, uh, one of the, the kings of, of Egypt. So that actually is, it even complicates it a little bit because the Roman women, for example, this whole thing about the statuary, in Rome itself, women, historical living women, were not really supposed to be depicted. We, there's just very few who are, and those who are, we hear about. They're mostly some sort of personification or something like that. So where does Rome go to get the prototypes to to, to pick somebody? And um, so it's Greek deities, something like an Athena or something like that, and Hellenistic queens. But you have to move a little bit away. So the I do think that because of the Rome had this peculiar, so Athens does have the Athenian Empire, so-called in the fifth century, but then it withdraws. And it's only with Alexander that there's this expansionism that's going on. The Romans have it all the time. And partly because the men were away, um, partly Roman women start to hear about them making real transactions, financial transactions, making decisions about who their daughter is going to marry, etc., even in the second century BC. So partly that's a kind of historical contingency argument. Um, but there was also the tension that you should have the women who's veiled, the woman who is not out, um, who's, who's home at home. Never seen in public. Never seen in public, yeah. What about the mythology? Uh, the mythology. We, I just reread it again. Mary Beard's um, Women in Power Manifesto came out in 2017. Very slim books. My, my first year students, I signed it the first week, last week, or two weeks ago, and I said, You can write home and say you read your first book in the first week. <laughs> um, but she points out, and I think rightly, we tend to think of Athena, Clytemnestra, all these women as very powerful, but they're disruptors of the status quo. And Tigane, she is powerful, everything goes to hell. I mean, she is powerful. So they're, dis they're disruptors of the status quo, and they are powerful, but in the end, at least, you know, I have to think about it a little more, at least according to Mary Beard, it in, in the end kind of reinforces this idea of don't make waves. If you stay in what your roles, that's probably the better thing. Yes? Could I challenge that as yes. a non-academic? When you look at the story of Odysseus, uh -huh. he comes back to Penelope. Athena, gray-eyed Athena, is the one who turns him into a beggar yeah. and, and then turns him back and gives him the power. Yeah. And so he has this woman protecting him and nurturing him. And then he's coming back to a woman who is able to hold a hundred suitors off by taking the, the, the robe, uh, sort of un undoing it every night. Yeah. So you've got two powerful women. You've got his wife, Penelope, who when he first approaches her and says, I'm back, she tests him. Yeah. yeah. She said, it was like, I'm not sure because you, you could be something that God sent. Yeah. Prove to me. Yeah. And then, then she talks about the marital bed and the tree. Yeah. So don't we have in the Odyssey, one of the great uh, books of classical Greece, don't we have these two, and I'm only mentioning two because they're the only ones I can remember specifically, aren't they powerful, independent precursors of modern women? 
They, I mean, people can make whatever they want out of these things. I mean, one would might say, well, Athena is a virgin, and Athena is uh, is also born from her father's head. She's not even born from a woman, so she has this kind of special status. One could also, I mean, I think the earliest view, the earliest time we see Penelope in the Odyssey, is when right in the first book, and um, and she comes down, Telemachus is striving to have people realize he's not just a little boy anymore. Telemachus is speaking to the suitors and everything is getting worse, and she comes down and says, let's talk about something else, let's have some, some point. and he says, mother, be quiet, get out of here. And she goes. So there are these, I mean, nothing is as black and white as I'm, I'm portraying. Nothing is as polarized. And there are obviously important and, and powerful women. I mean, think about any time men would go off to war, there's no antibiotics. You, you, you get hurt, why? And um, so there were women who uh, had to be capable and make decisions. So. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, I think it's open to, it's, it's, it's not, you know, the Greeks were bad and had nothing and the Romans were a little more, were a little more, um, I don't know whether one would even say, um, liberated or whatever. But there do seem to be more roles for women in the, in the empire. Anything else, or is it time for, yes? Um, I, I don't know much history, but I do know that there were very wealthy women in Rome at that time. Have you thought of looking into the business angle? Because there was certainly like, uh, artists of life was very rich. So, yeah. so they were business women. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have any of that. I mean, we, we see those, those brick stamps, that groovy little brick stamp I showed. Um, that seems to be the best evidence that we have about the business dealings. Otherwise, we don't have them. We have some, like, like oops, the business dealings of Jacundus from Herculaneum. All of that kind of ephemeral writing has gone. We just don't have any kind of, of information about that. But we do have things, and there's been a wonderful series of, of biographies by people like Susan Trojari, brilliant, brilliant person, taught at Yale for a while, um, where about Servilia, who's the mother of Brutus, or, um, or others, like that Terentia, who is the wife of Cicero. And you know, you're squeezing out as much information as you can get from a, a sentence here or there in Cicero's correspondence. But there is, I mean, there do seem, and I think, but I have to end my book sometime, but I think that, that you know, it would be wonderful to think about really the distinction. I think that women at the end of the Republic did have more roles and more autonomy than, so really at one point said to Cicero, you can't enter into this discussion. I know more than you do. And he left. And that's, that's, about, that's a lot of people say. And because the men were away at war, they ran business. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And they controlled money. Yeah, absolutely. Yes? I'm just curious how to be sort of to put in the balance that the contemporaneous link in Cleopatra's Alexandria, that women had the ability to get divorced and own property, and there were all sorts of things written into law that seems so um, much more than <coughs> was going on in Rome at that time. I just wonder how that kind of... A divorce was something that was very... Some people have said that one in two marriages at the end of the Republic, when we actually hear about it, were ended in divorce. One, two, and it, it was very, very frequent to have what we might call blended families. There is a thing that if the husband and wife split up, the husband, the former husband, always got the children. Always. I mean, it's just he's the papa familialis, and so he gets the children, whether or not he wants them. Um, so there is, 
but, but there is this kind, and, and we do hear that some people, like, like Tarantia didn't like Tulia's second husband, the Cicero's daughter's second husband, and they said, nah, we're not going to marry, and then they married somebody else who was much worse, but that's, that's hindsight for me. <laughs> but um, it was a different thing in, in Egypt, of course, with the Ptolemies, with the ruling family. Yes, sir. Um, uh, I just had a question about whether or not there was a conflict with the way women were viewed in the provinces versus the way they were viewed in the city of Rome itself. Because I remember seeing a coin depicted of Libya with her as the day of Libya alongside a coin of Augustus being depicted as city founder in the colonies that Augustus founded yeah. along Anatolia. So yeah. was there any conflict in that sort of yeah, it, it, um, it, That's an excellent question. It seems very clear from the information that I've amassed, but again, I'm not going on there admissible, that there, outside of Rome, there was much more freedom of movement. We see, we see inscriptions which, which refer to an imperial woman as a patron of a town, or in your case, the coins that, that call her a tea stace, you know, a, a founder of the town. And um, in Rome itself, however, it was much more restricted. Um, I mean, basically, the only place you saw women was in their funerals. <laughs> Imperial women, you get that would be it. So, but that's an excellent, excellent question. And um, I don't know why Rome, I'm not exactly sure why Rome itself, the capital city, was so that, that the roles were much more tightly um, guarded. But that's an excellent question. Yes? yes. It was interesting that in Virgil's Aeneid uh, dialogue had such a big role and she was such a big character, powerful. Yeah, yeah, but she, people will often say, that she is in some ways modeled on Cleopatra. She's a foreign queen. So that she, Aeneas, beautiful Aeneas, P.S. Aeneas, is going to found Rome, and this, and she, what a, she was something. He, he gets thrown up by a terrible storm in Carthage. He walks around, the city is rising, everything is beautifully controlled, and it's Dido who's doing it, and then she falls for him. And that's it. <laughs> so, but yeah, she's a, she is a wonderful. So again, a kind of counter example um, that we see. But it all kind of mixes up. Nothing is black and white, as I said. Great. Well, thank you. Some refreshments.